So you wanna know about the time that I logged 40 million people out of Twitter. There was software before Envoy, it's called TSA. Early 2013, I wrote a one uh, character bug into that software. And this bug, it was in date handling code. I think it was a few days before New Year's of 2015. The week year became 2015, but the actual calendar year was still 2014. And Android decided that the authentication tokens were too old and it logged everyone out. And at the time, I'm up in the mountains in central Idaho in a place where there's no internet. And I start getting text messages with people frantically saying, you know, everyone is getting logged out of Twitter on Android. We don't know what's going on. As you might imagine, lots of people don't know their passwords. Um, so lots of people did not log back in. And this, this created a, uh, a very complicated situation over a long period of time. But it's an important part of the story because that software, which was called TSA, is kind of the precursor to Envoy. At that time, I think as an industry in the you know internet cloud native space, we were in the middle of the hype cycle of microservices. Turn to 2015, people were starting to be like, this microservices thing might be real. Martin Fowler actually published an article around microservices architectures and what is it, which I always feel like when Martin starts to publish something, that means it's entering the cultural zeitgeist. And it was clear that this migration from monolithic to microservice it will be bringing so many right benefits, like you can go faster, you can write in whatever language you want, but also a lot of, you know, like in every new innovation, there is a lot of gap, right? A lot of problem to solve. Gone were the days where you could force people to like, no, 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 you got to build in this Java stack, otherwise that's, that's the only thing we support. People started using their phones more, right? We were using applications that were web, more web-based than ever before. It became very much clear to me that one cloud provider or one team cannot build everything. In terms of like, call it service proxy or service meshes out there, there wasn't really anything. Most people either kind of built their own or built on an existing uh, project, whether it was like an Nginx or HA proxy. It become clear that emergence of Envoy was inevitable. My name is Pete Morelli, uh, VP of Engineering here at Lyft. Been here almost eight years. Before that, I was at Twitter and at Salesforce doing similar roles. Matt was part of my team at Twitter. Uh, we ran, among other things, the Twitter front edge. I think Twitter at the time, it still is, uh, was a little bit crazy. After the outage event, I think a lot of us have become, shall we say, disgruntled with Twitter. And so he was interested in exploring other fields and, and other companies. So we had a conversation. I said, this is sort of where I think Lyft will be going. I think Lyft cares very much about performance and reliability and how mobile works, especially with the networks that we usually use. And so Matt thought, I think that was an interesting place to go. He knew me, so we were lucky that way, or I definitely was lucky. So the landscape at Lyft um, in 2015, a uh, small team, really good engineers. And like many companies of that era, Lyft had uh, adopted microservices and the, the rollout was not going well. Lyft was started with a monolithic architecture. I'm trying to remember the reliability rate at the time, but we had like, it was, it was not like four nines, it was closer into the like one nine. <laughs> Things would break and people would not know what was broken or how to fix it. Yeah, so let's understand the problem, right? You know, let's say that you have a monolithic application, getting a request to the call, everything is in my binary, right? You have a log in there, you're getting the log after it. If something is not working, you're looking at this, you know exactly what the problem is, very simple. But here's what's happening when you have microservices. First of all, you have a lot of them. Second of all, so like basically from each type of microservices, you're doing replica. So you have more than one option, more than one instance of that. 
And then besides that, it's not going to one place. It's going to one microservices, so sending it to the second microservice, to the third microservices. So now let's say that something is wrong. How do you know where it's happening? You don't even know which logs is related to those, this, this specific request. And it was so bad at the time that I would say that the microservices rollout was partially aborted in the sense that engineers did not trust the microservices. So any critical code was still put into the monolith. And you know, only second tier systems were, um, it was okay to use microservices. So it was actually the worst of both worlds where you had already taken on the technical debt to make microservices, but you weren't willing to invest in those microservices. So it, it was a poor engineering situation that needed fixing one way or the other, either to roll back and keep everything in the monolith or make the microservices system work. My view at the time is that the only way to make that work was to solve some of the fundamental reliability issues around observability, around fault tolerance, around many of the things that are required to make a microservices system actually work. And so Matt came up with the idea of doing these, this particular set of cross-cutting concerns around communication, reliability, discovery, circuit breakers, to do that as a sidecar. Some good healthy debate about whether this was a good investment because, you know, HA Proxy and Nginx were there, but they weren't quite what we needed. Having worked on systems similar at Twitter and knowing the type of observability that we wanted and knowing that Nginx and HA Proxy um, did not have that observability at the time, that was actually probably the primary motivation. So it was relatively confident that we could build something that ultimately would have more developer productivity and faster feature iteration if we built it ourselves. I think the discussion was relatively quick. I think it probably took a month at most, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, but once we did that, we sort of put to get, you know, Matt put his head down and like in a, you know, a month or so was getting the first builds out. I pretty much just wrote code constantly. I mean, I was just coding, coding, coding to get to a place where we could provide some value. That was really the initial goal and to get it deployed. And the very first thing that it did was provide metrics. At that time, Amazon's load balancers didn't provide. On the dashboard, we have things like connections per second, requests per second, the current number of connections and requests, overall success rate. Um, we have latency percentiles for all of the different backend services that we have at Lyft. We put Envoy directly into production and by the fall of 2015, it was taking all of Lyft's traffic. As we decomposed the PHP monolith, we used it more and more and added more features, but I'd say the core functionality was built probably three months. I had always felt at Lyft that you know getting Envoy fully deployed, you know, I had just suspected that it was going to be difficult. And Envoy provided so much functionality for people in terms of observability, in terms of greater reliability, that teams adopted Envoy on their own, and we got it out relatively quickly. There's two things to know about the deployment of Envoy. One, there's Edge, and so that's just the main gateway for requests coming in from the internet, and then we're saying, oh, anything to request a ride goes to the ride service. Anything for billing goes to the billing service, and so it'll do the routing there. And that's the first component they enter, and then after that, it is the micro, more of the microservices. And so I joined the team in June of 2016, and Lyft was scaling really quickly. And like we were facing, right, so Lyft and on-demand services have a really interesting problem. It could be, I don't know, it decided to rain like downpour this one day or like, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon and there's a big spike. And we had to be able to, you know, spin up new services and get traffic routed to that really quickly. And so that was one thing that Envoy does really well is one service discovery. So whenever a new machine comes up, you can have that a part of the clusters that you send things to and that helped Envoy or Lyft scale up. There's a joke that we had for Envoy, and I hope someone's keeping that joke alive, is that there's a staff for that. And it's mostly because you can pretty much, by looking at the metrics and you can look at traces and logs to help that, you can pretty much figure out exactly what's going on. If a service was using Envoy, we made these beautiful dashboards for them by default. And people wanted those nice dashboards. So 
This is an example of one of the dashboards that we built relatively early on at, at Lyft. This is the top level Envoy Edge dashboard for Lyft. You know, a lot of the things that you see on here in terms of connections per second and requests per second and success rate and all of the other things that are, that are happening here, um, they might seem, uh, you know, very common today. But when we first developed this in 2015 and started to make a bunch of this data available to engineers at Lyft, it was really, it was really revolutionary for people. And then a lot of the other stuff in terms of reducing outages through, again, timeouts, retries, all of these other policies, people just took them because, well, they liked the fact that their services were no longer, you know, falling over during load-based outages and all of those things. Then we actually decided, well, you know, we've got this one service and we had been using HA proxy here. What if we deployed Envoy and we could get all this observability and well, now you've got your service mesh. It's, it's only two nodes, but I mean, that's your first service mesh. This is really what kicked off, you know, the entire project is the observability access that we had. And then we were able to expand this out to all of the services, creating a service mesh. And that's what really got all the developers at Lyft very excited about Envoy initially. The hard part was making it usable for engineers. And I don't know if you've looked at the configurations, the configurations are really dense. And trying to make it intuitive for our application developers who rightfully don't want to know anything about networking. It is a different set of problems and application developers are really great at making good APIs and making things intuitive for the end users and infrastructure engineers like myself like to maybe go a little more into the weeds. And so we were working on increasing the, more just like the comfort of the engineers with Envoy. In hindsight, at Lyft's point in time, letting me go off and like write this new networking proxy. I mean, it is kind of crazy. I hadn't much thought about the future other than being impactful at Lyft. That was my first goal. The fact that we had built something similar at Twitter, the fact that we built something similar yet again at Lyft indicated that there's probably a need for this thing, whatever it was within the industry. I think that we decided, look, Envoy has been very successful at Lyft. We've invested a lot in this. Lyft is not a networking proxy company. Let's use this as an opportunity to actually do open source. I'll say quite honestly that we were very naive about what that process looks like. And I think we wanted to do it the right way. I think at other companies we've seen, you know, People came up with some great code and they threw it over the wall and it sort of bit rotted. And we didn't want to do that with um, what we created. Going to management, I think, was a very easy conversation. Logan, the CEO at the time, super supportive, wanted lots more open source. I said, no, let's do high quality open source. So big supporter of it. I think, you know, one of the benefits to Lyft as well was that reputationally, people understood that some pretty hard engineering was happening under the covers here. And so I think that was a super helpful um, short-term benefit in terms of recruiting. Yes, yes. I'll give you a chicken chop. <laughs> All right, sit. All right, we're gonna we're gonna be a good dog. Are we getting stuff done to them? It's always very difficult to hire the smartest people uh, in the world, right? Open source is a clever hack around that problem where you know you're essentially externalizing your R and D costs by sharing this piece of software and getting other folks to contribute and so on. So you may not be able to hire you know the hundred most smartest, best engineers around low-level service mesh proxy stuff, but you could convince them to use your project and contribute to it. So essentially, instead of you know having just Matt Klein working on you know Envoy, there was you know tens and dozens other folks you know contributing for folks that Lyft would never hire in in the first place or couldn't hire because they, they were happy you know elsewhere. You know we decided in summer of 2016. Well, let's let's let, let's go and see if we can actually find someone else who will who will use this. I think my personal goal was could we get even one other company? Could we get one company, you know, maybe like Lyft to use Envoy? That would be amazing. Like that was my goal. So we went and we talked to, I don't even remember at this time, you know, some of Lyft's peer companies in, in 2016, like Airbnb and Stripe and companies like that and Pinterest. And, you know, we, we went in and showed them what we had built and showed them some documentation, all those things. And 
everyone was very positive about what we had done. So a lot of these companies said, wow, this is really cool. Um, you know, we would love to think about using this, you know, and we'll, we'll see what happens and we'll, you know, come, come back in six or 12 months. And I think that in the run up to open source, um, you know, not achieving a large partner, it certainly did not make me happy. And I was worried about the long-term success, but you know, obviously we, we pushed forward anyway. All right. All right, how's this? So I'm Richard Lee. I was uh, CEO and founder, well, always a founder of Ambassador Labs uh, starting in 2015. And about nine months ago, I transitioned to chief product officer. Turned to 2015, I still didn't really have an idea for a company at the time. So I just started talking to lots of people, trying to understand what the problems were. And all right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I remember when I first heard about Envoy, we were chatting with some of the folks from Airbnb, uh, I think maybe about a year ago. And then when we ran into um, one of the folks from Yelp, who's actually somewhere in the audience. Igor at Airbnb had told me about Envoy. And then John Billings at Yelp had told me about Envoy. And I had spent enough time with them to know that they, they were not sort of fad-driven developers. They would have only looked at a new technology if it were actually solving some problem they actually had. Uh, so I tracked down Matt and, and we were holding our second Microsoft Practitioner Summit. And I said, Matt, do you want to speak? Because it seems like this would be a great fit. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Matt Klein, I'm a software engineer at Lyft, and today we'll be talking about Envoy, uh, and in general, from Lyft's migration to a monolithic service architecture to a, quote, service mesh architecture. And then he gave his talk, and I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. And then I remember turning to a co-founder, I was like, I don't know what we should build, but we should build something on top of Envoy. That was sort of the thing. After we open source, the initial reaction was super positive. I mean, people look at the documentation and be like, oh, this is an exciting uh, project. It has all these features. This is great. But what was interesting to me is that, I mean, within weeks, days even of open sourcing, the companies that I started to hear from were, were actually like Apple and Microsoft and other very large companies because these are large companies that have large problems. They're, they have large existing you know, C and C++ code bases. They're not intimidated by this kind of thing. And they were excited. MP3 is there and there's a French cafe. I took on the role of product manager for gRPC in late 2014, early 2015. So Matt actually was an adopter of gRPC, Lyft and Matt. So he used to give me all the feedback of like, here's what's working, here's what's not working. I think about six or seven months before actually Envoy launched, he told me about like, hey, we're working on this thing. By the way, here is the docs <laughs> and tell me what you think. Two, two days of like just scanning those docs. Like this is the thing that caught my attention first. <laughs> First class HTTP2 support, because that's the one that I was painfully looking <laughs> for. The, the only open questions left were like, is this thing, does this thing work? And there was only one way to know it, which is, let's test it. <laughs> we did our performance tests and we were like, sort of blown away by, dude, this thing is just coming out in market and it's already like 80% as performant as Nginx's. We can wrap our hands around it and cover the rest of the gap that is there. We had decided that time that uh, we're gonna use that for Istio. So Louis and I had the job of like convincing <laughs> all these people to like why this is a good idea. I wrote a document uh, about having a single control plane that would allow first party, second party, and third party to, to plug into the network and create this big ecosystem. I went to 
our proxy team and propose that. And understandably, they were busy actually with building the product. So I put the document into a drawer and thought not the right time. And then uh, Louis Ryan, who was working at what would become a STO, came to me and he said, Anna, there is this new proxy. It's not open sourced yet. Do you want to look at it? And uh, I said, sure, why not? I was skeptical because we had such a wonderful one. And uh, I looked at the, the proxy and then suddenly everything dropped. And I realized this is it. This is it. So I canceled all the meetings for next two days. And the only thing I did was pouring over documentation and, and um, source code. And I realized this proxy has everything I wanted. In January 2016, I went for a review with our SVP. And it was in a small room with six VPs. And I proposed to use Envoy uh, for everything in Google. And it was very much a um, quiet meeting. I just went through the slides and nobody was questioning me. And Ur seems to be, at some point, I thought he was bored. He started looking at his phone. And he asked me, why do you want Envoy? It has only six PRs. And so it turned out that he went on the phone to GitHub and checked, checked on Envoy. He said, why wouldn't, your idea is good, but why wouldn't you use Nginx? And I said, I don't want Nginx, I just want Envoy. And he said, you don't want a proxy. You want something else. I said, yeah, I want something else. I want a platform. And he said, sure, go ahead, do it. I knew at the time that landing Google would take Envoy from, from a trajectory, you know, it's looking like this, to one that's looking like, you know, this. And uh, it was clear to me that I needed to do, we need to do what was required to, to make that a success. Uh, so so we, we absolutely wanted to steer, right? We wanted influence. Uh, we wanted to make sure it's performant, it's reliable, it's secure. Yes, and that's why we, we organized the Envoy platform team with 10 engineers. Our job was to make Envoy successful, both at Google and in the open source world. Everything was designed beautifully for, for anyone who wants to use it, small to large companies. Implementation-wise, it was written by a startup for a startup, right? Matt had done what he needed to do to get it up and working, but there were a lot of things missing that you needed to run it at scale. And what was really important to us alongside pure performance were properties such as vendor neutrality and extensibility. And Envoy was really uh, a standout there. And we adopted an Envoy first strategy around about that time. At first, for its use in Istio and the service mesh world, but increasingly in its use across many of our internal production networking systems, as well as Google Cloud products. You know, we'd done a lot of analysis and kind of firmed up some of the weaker areas of code. Um, and then Harvey, uh, who, who was on the Envoy platform team at Google, uh, ran a hackathon. What we were interested in doing in the Envoy platform team at Google was not finding one-off issues or playing whack-a-mole or poking at Envoy and saying, well, it's, it's, it's going to fall over, look at it in, in its current state. We were interested in how we could structurally harden Envoy. I looked at an area of code I knew hadn't been particularly hardened, and I think it took basically 20 minutes to write a shell script that would uh, that would that would take down a production machine, which is great because then you know we just made sure that Envoy was uh, secure against all these standard internet attacks. There was a bunch of gaps that people started to tell him. Then a bunch of developers, engineers started to get at it, and he was like, "This is amazing! Like one of the biggest you know tech companies is wrapping what I built and is adding engineering power to it. It's like this is great." It was exciting, it was uh, stressful, it was, you know, s scary, it was all, you know. We had more developers working on Envoy outside of Lyft than inside of Lyft very quickly. And that to me was amazing to see. The 2017 timeframe was very hectic for me because Envoy was blowing up, like seeing super wide adoption, 
Um, there's a lot of interest from the venture capital community, you know, to get me to, to, to start a company around Envoy and ultimately I decided not to for a variety of reasons. But there have been a lot of companies that have popped up around Envoy. I really, really like the design. I think Matt nailed it. Like, I mean, it was perfectly designed with extensibility, which is something that I personally really like because that means that I can come with exciting use cases of how to make it work even more than what is in the core. Without the vendors who have poured their own effort and love into Envoy, Envoy wouldn't be what it is today. And a lot of our customers that we we're talking to were like, we're deploying on Kubernetes, and we're like, well, in order to deploy it, you need an API gateway. Envoy's a proxy. It became obvious then that we should figure out how to marry Kubernetes with Envoy, and that's how we built Ambassador API Gateway. You know you have to connect your application to the internet, so we want to make it as easy as possible. But we wanted to bring some benefit to our customers. So one of the things that we did basically said to them, look, we want to take that Envoy and make it the best API gateway that exists. So you tell us what is the thing that you need. And we built so much to it. So we built, for instance, WAF, Web Application Firewall. We build, you know, data loss prevention, transformation. One of the things that we did recently, which is extremely unique, is we basically teach Envoy how to become a GraphQL server, which is really, really powerful, and it's all without writing any line of code, right? It's all basically declarative, which is fantastic. Envoy has always been one of the cornerstone projects, and uh, it's at the heart of what Tetrate does. The mission for the company is power the world's application traffic and that's all kinds of applications and all kinds of traffic, and it's fully built on top of uh, Envoy. Over time, what became clear is that certain adopters wanted the neutral holding ground. As Envoy became more and more successful, we needed PR and marketing and events and legal and other stuff, and, and I think over time, the cost-benefit analysis became more clear for Envoy to join the CNCF. And so I think it was uh, June 2017, we sat down for uh, a coffee and literally talked about, you know, his aspirations for Envoy, how CNCF could help. Uh, and that's kind of how that initial discussion, you know, happened. But I think a lot of people don't realize is like, you know, once you open source a project, code is just the bare minimum to truly build a successful open source project community. You need to build an ecosystem that involves events, marketing, security audits, translations, and that's something that the CNCF provides. You know, Matt saw that like, holy crap, like I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do this alone, so might as well, you know, have folks that are very good at building ecosystems like we've kind of proved ourselves out with Kubernetes, Prometheus at the time, let's do the same thing uh, for Envoy. And so I think for Matt, it was a bit of a, you know, no brainer, very little downside. As I've said, I think I was extremely naive about the effort that was gonna be required to have a six, very successful open source project. And I actually think that naivete worked in my favor because if I had known what I was getting myself into, I'm not, I'm not sure that I would have done it. Uh. It is mind blowing how much adoption Envoy has gotten. And a lot of the time we don't even know until someone would do a talk at EnvoyCon, it would be a major internet company being like, this is how we moved our front end server over to Envoy. And it's like, Oh, they're using it now? It was not obvious when it was just Matt and, you know, and a couple commits from us and a couple commits from, but when you get however many engineers from Google started working on this thing and the Lyft folks, now you're starting to see overwhelming engineering velocity. Booking.com, I think Apple, like it, it's, there's just countless, there's banks. Um, Envoy's truly powers, you know, tons and tons of systems out there. You're using it every day for real. Do you know how exciting it is? You know, and when you're ordering Lyft and when you're using Google search and it's everywhere. Envoy truly transformed and essentially uplifted the whole industry to, you know, support cloud native uh, deployments. To me, it's, it's just amazing to kind of see how one small project and, you know, you know even individual could completely change how the industry builds uh, a certain type of software. It's not just exciting to see, you know, from an industry standpoint, but also like how it's gone from what is this thing to like now, which is like, Oh, I've heard and tried this. I know people are doing this in my company. By the way, 
We feel A, B, C as gaps. Can you help us? Envoy has succeeded beyond my wildest thoughts, right? And it runs so much of like modern clouds and infrastructure now, it's amazing to see. I'm, I'm super happy about where we ended up. Kind of lesson here is like, you know, don't be scared to share. Sometimes it may not work out and sometimes it will change, you know, the industry uh, for the better. So for folks that are working in, you know, companies all over the world, you've come up with something cool encourage your organization to share that. There's nothing, you know, very little to lose on that, you know, and so much, uh, you know, to gain in that kind of knowledge sharing. Uh, and so. Envoy is so widely adopted at, at, at this point that it, it blows my mind. I mean, I, I just, I, I can hardly believe where we've come to. I mean, Envoy has changed the industry and in many ways, um, but in terms of being revolutionary, I actually don't view Envoy as being revolutionary. I, I actually, I think that we build on what came before, right? And, and everything is very iterative. Envoy would not exist without Nginx. It would not exist without HAProxy. It would not exist without many of the systems that came previously. I don't view Envoy as revolutionary. I view it as evolutionary.